Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston. Welcome to lecture 44 and the final lecture of Introductory Linear Algebra. In today's class, we're going to take diagonalization one step farther than we have in the past and start computing even weirder functions of matrices now. So we're going to see how we can sort of reasonably define things like e to the power of a matrix or sine of a matrix or logarithm of a matrix and so on. Okay, and the way you do this is just the same way that you did arbitrary powers of a matrix. Use diagonalization. So to give a bit of a background on why this is a reasonable thing to do, recall from Calculus 2 that lots of different functions, you can write them as what we call Taylor series, or in special case, Maclaurin series, okay? So for example, the function e to the power x, you can write that as 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the power 4 over 4, four factorial, and so on. It's sort of almost like an infinite polynomial, okay? And the important feature here is that each term in this sum over here, well, it's just, it's a power, okay? And powers generalize very well to matrices, okay? So for example, I mean, just based on this formula here, we might think that a reasonable definition for e to the power of a, e to the power of a matrix, is, well, here we've just got a zeroth power of a, here we've got the first power, here we've got the second power, here we've got a third power, and so on. We, we can just replace all of those x's by a's. And all of those things then make sense, right? We just get identity plus a plus a squared over two factorial, a cubed over three factorial, and so on. All of those operations are well-defined because scalar multiplication and powers, we understand those for matrices, okay? So this sort of gives us a way of using things we already understand to define something new. It, it lets us define weirder functions in terms of things we already understand, okay? So, Th this raises a problem though, because like, how do we actually compute something like this? Okay, like we can't actually add up infinitely many terms. Okay, but fortunately, diagonalization comes to the rescue. Okay, all that you've got to do is, well, just apply the function to the diagonal piece in a diagonalization, just like we did with weird matrix powers. Okay, so let's go through a quick example here before we just do a little bit more justification for why this works. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to compute e to the power of this matrix here. Okay, and the way we're going to do it is via diagonalization. Fortunately, we already computed a diagonalization of this matrix. We did this in the previous lecture video. Okay, so a equals pdp inverse where d is this and p is this and p, is, p inverse is that. We computed this all in the previous lecture video. Okay, but now if we want to compute e to the power a, what do we do? Okay, well, we just do what we always do. Just do whatever we're doing to the diagonal piece in the middle. Okay, so leave the p and p inverse the same. Just leave them alone on the outsides and do e to the d, e to the diagonal matrix in the middle. And the way that you compute some function of a diagonal matrix, well, just do that function to each of the diagonal pieces. Okay, so like do e to the first diagonal entry, and that's the new di first diagonal entry. e to the second diagonal entry gives me the new second diagonal entry, and so on, all the way down the diagonal. All right, so let's just do that. Okay, so p and p inverse, we leave those alone. I pulled the one third from p inverse out in front because I can. Okay, and then I just took this matrix here and I did e to each of its diagonal entries. So e to the power one gives me e. e to the power four is just e to the power four. And then I multiplied those matrices back together and I get my answer. So here I did the rightmost multiplication and I get this matrix, the one third, four, one, 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 that just carries along for the ride in that first step. And now I do this next matrix multiplication. So you gotta do two matrix multiplications to undiagonalize something at the end, right? And then I get this kind of admittedly ugly looking matrix at the end. But that is what e to the power a is, okay? And why does this work? Like, why on earth would this matrix here, why does that equal this ugly infinite sum that we said was the definition of e to the power a? What, like, why are those two things the same? We computed them in very different ways. And the reason is because diagonalization works so well with powers, okay? So if we just start off with the definition of e to the power a, it's this infinite sum here, and just replace all of the a's by the diagonalization of a. Replace a by pdp inverse. Replace a squared by pdp inverse squared. But then remember, you can bring the square into the d piece in the middle. And then do the same thing with a cubed. That's p d cubed p inverse. The next term is going to be a to the power 4. That's going to be p d to the power 4 p inverse and so on. Every single term you can replace by, you know, a diagonalization where you just do the power to the diagonal piece in the middle. And then the clever thing that you can do is you can notice every single term in this sum here, 
Well, you can factor a p out on the left and a p inverse out on the right, and you get this expression here, okay? And what you're left with in the middle there, well, that's exactly e to the power of d, right? Each of these here, d and d squared and d cubed, you can compute each of those entry-wise, okay? So the top left entry of this matrix here, well, this is gonna be a diagonal matrix, and its top left entry is gonna be one plus d11 plus one over two factorial d11 squared plus one over three factorial d11 cubed, and so on. In other words, the top left entry is gonna be e to the power of d11. And the same argument applies in every single diagonal entry. Okay, so this thing in here, well, that's just exactly e to the power d as we computed it by applying e to each of those diagonal entries. Okay, and then the p and the p inverse just carry along for the ride. Okay, so this is how you actually compute the exponential of a matrix, even though this thing up here, even though this infinite sum is the definition of it. Okay, and I mean, throughout all of this, we're ignoring some convergence concerns. That's a topic for another class, okay? Yeah, we're adding up infinitely many things. That can sometimes go wrong. It's not going to go wrong in any of the situations that we're doing it in this class, though. Okay, so we're going to ignore convergence concerns for the purposes of this course. All right. There are a couple useful properties of this matrix exponential, of e to the power of a matrix, that are analogous to properties that it has for real numbers, right? For real numbers, if you do e to the power of zero, you get one. And the matrix version of that statement is still true. e to the power of the zero matrix is the identity matrix, okay? And this is just because zero, like the zero matrix, it's diagonal. So how do you compute that? Well, you do e to each of the diagonal entries. Each of the diagonal entries is zero. So it just turns those diagonal entries into e to the power of zero, which is one, it turns all the diagonal entries into ones. In other words, it turns the zero matrix into the identity matrix, okay? Another nice property is that, well, e to the power a times e to the power minus a is always the identity matrix. In other words, the inverse of e to the power a is e to the power minus a. And again, this is just completely analogous to the exponential function for real numbers, right? Um, e to the power x times e to the power minus x is just the number one. In other words, one divided by e to the power x is e to the power negative x, right? These are just exponential rules. And yeah, this is true for matrices as well. Okay, and the way we can see this is just use diagonalization, okay? If a has some diagonalization, p, d, p inverse, okay? Then negative a, well, there's a nice diagonalization of that as well. It's p negative d, p inverse. And then you just multiply e to these things together and see what happens, right? So e to the a, it's gonna be P e to the d p inverse and e to the minus a, it's gonna be the same thing except with minus d in there instead of just d itself. And then same thing that happens with these diagonalizations multiplied together as always happens, the p inverse and the p in the middle, those are gonna cancel out, give you an identity matrix, it goes away, okay? And then you're left with p e to the d, e to the minus d, p inverse, and then you just work one diagonal entry at a time. E to the d is a diagonal matrix. E to the minus d is a di diagonal matrix. You multiply their diagonal entries together, and well, they're all just inverses of each other. Okay, These, this is just a whole bunch of real number multiplications now along the diagonal, and you just get each of those products equals one, so it's an identity matrix in the middle. So it's just p times p inverse is an identity matrix. Okay, so yeah, this product over here really is the identity matrix. In other words, these two matrices really are inverses of each other, okay? And this, I mean, this matrix exponential, like it might seem like just sort of a weird mathematical trick, but this comes up all the time when you're solving systems of linear uh, differential equations. So you will see this matrix function coming up over and over and over again if you take more math classes, okay? But in a sense, like there's nothing special about the, the matrix exponential here in sort of a mathematical sense. You can use lots of other functions in its place, okay? You can also compute like the logarithm of a matrix or a sine of a matrix or the arctangent of a matrix. It doesn't really matter. As long as it has a Taylor series, you can do all of the same stuff, okay? So for example, if you want to compute sine of a matrix, okay, well, the way to do that is you diagonalize it and you do sine of the diagonal piece, exactly the same procedure, okay? You always just do whatever it is you wanna to do to the diagonal piece in the middle. So here I've just copied down the same diagonalization that we've been working with for the last couple examples, okay? And now what do you do? Well, sine of A, it's just P times sine of D times P inverse. Okay, so I just need to compute sine of that diagonal matrix in the middle. And again, if the matrix is diagonal, just do it entry-wise. Compute sine of one and sine of four, and those are your new diagonal entries, and then undiagonalize everything. Multiply it all back together, 
And what do you get? Well, again, I'm just going to copy down the first matrix, not do anything with it yet. Do this matrix multiplication on the right to get this matrix. And now do my next matrix multiplication. You have two matrix multiplications to do to undiagonalize something. And you get this lovely, ugly matrix here, but that is your final answer, okay? This is what sign of that matrix A is. Okay, and that does it. That is, well, that's sort of a summary anyway of the things that you can do with diagonalization. We sort of pick up and start from this point when you get to advanced linear algebra, okay? So there are some matrices out there that are not diagonalizable. So this raises a very natural question of, for example, like how close to diagonalizable, or sorry, how close to diagonal can you make a non-diagonalizable matrix? Like you, we know that, you know, there are matrices out there, matrices without a full set of linearly independent eigenvectors. Um, we can't always get this piece in the middle to be diagonal. How close to diagonal can you get it? Well, that's a topic for advanced linear algebra, the next linear algebra course, if you take it. Okay, another related question is, well, how do you compute these matrix functions for, func for matrices that are not diagonalizable? Eh, that's something we do in advanced linear algebra again. All right, so I may or may not see you there for that. Either way, thanks for watching and have a good one.